कर दें अगर ये सारे मैंने लेक्चर जो हैं वो गूगल ड्राइव पे आपकी मैनेजमेंट साइंसेस का फोल्डर है जो भी हैं डिस्टेंस लर्नर और सब के लिए ये कर दिया हुआ है व्हाट्सएप पे मैंने ग्रुप में शेयर कर दिया हुआ है आप भी हैं ग्रुप में हाँ तो वो शेयर हो गया हुआ है तो वो आप उसमें से पहले उसमें से डाउनलोड करते रह करें कई दफ़ा ताकि अपने कंप्यूटर में लोकल में ना आप उसको डाउनलोड कर लिया करें जो भी मटेरियल हो बस डाउनलोड कर लें ताकि डुप्लीकेट आपके पास भी हो जाए वैसे टू स्टार्ट विद आई हर्ड अ वेरी गुड न्यूज़ अबाउट दिस कि एक बंदा जो है सोचे एक लाइफ टाइम में वो स्टार्टेड हिज लाइफ एज ए बस कंडक्टर राइट एंड वेंट ऑन टू बिकम अ सिंगर अल्लाह ने दिया हुआ था टैलेंट लेकिन सबसे बड़ी और बात है कि उसने जिस बंदे को तालीम नहीं थी ना उसने अपनी औलाद को तालीम दी हाइस्ट लेवल इसकी बेटी है ये वीडियो एनिमेशन और ग्राफिक्स की आर्टिस्ट है और ये ऑस्कर के लिए नॉमिनेट होगी इसे बहुत सी पिक्चर्स में पहले भी लाइफ ऑफ पाए बहुत सी डिफरेंट मूवीज़ थी जिनमें इसने किया था और सो बेस्ड ऑन रीसेंट मूवी अभी इनकी कोई आई है एक नाम मुझे याद नहीं आ रहा उसमें इसके विजुअल इफेक्ट्स शी इज़ अ विजुअल इफेक्ट डिज़ाइनर और एन आर्टिस्ट तो इसको ऑस्कर के लिए नॉमिनेट कर लिए तो सोचें एक लाइफ टाइम में कोई इंसान जो पढ़ा लिखा ना हो लेकिन वो अपनी औलाद को एजुकेट कर दे एक लाइफ टाइम में कि वो ऑस्कर ले ले तो ये हमारे पाकिस्तान के लिए किसी इंसान के लिए कितना बड़ा लेसन है कि इंसान कहाँ से कहाँ पहुँच सकता है नहीं देर इज़ नो लिमिट टू इट सो इट इज़ अ गुड न्यूज़ आई वॉन्ट टू शेयर विद यू ओके जी आज का जो टॉपिक है वो बेसिकली वीडियोस हैं डिटेल में सुनने की ज़रूरत है दो पार्ट्स हैं एक हम ब्रेक से पहले सुनेंगे एक ब्रेक के बाद ठीक है लेकिन बेसिकली हमें कॉन्सेप्चुअल इसका क्या है कि आपको ऑर्गेनाइजेशन के अंदर सबसे इम्पॉर्टेंट चीज़ मैनेज करने के लिए डिसीजन मेकिंग है मोस्ट ऑफ द थिंग्स डू नॉट हैपन बिकॉज यू कैन नॉट डिसाइड ऐसे ही होता है एक हमारे एक प्राइम मिनिस्टर थे एक्स बोगरा मेरा ख्याल है हाँ उन्होंने सेल्फ हीलिंग प्रोसेस रखा होता था जितनी फाइलें आती थी ना तो वो टेबल पे जमा होती रहती उनका आइडिया ये था कि अगर ये फाइल पे कुछ ना करें और ये पढ़ी रहे ना तो कुछ अर्से बाद इसको कुछ करने की ज़रूरत ही नहीं जाती सेल्फ हीलिंग के खुद ही मसले हल हो जाते हैं तो फाइल वो निकालते ही नहीं थे आप समझ रहे हैं ठीक है सो डिसीजन मेकिंग देखें डिसीजन राइट और रॉन्ग हो सकता है कोई भी लेकिन कहते हैं न्यूट्रलिटी इज़ अ सिन एट द टाइम ऑफ क्राइसिस स्पेसिफिकली न्यूट्रलिटी इज़ अ सिन क्योंकि आप राइट या रॉन्ग चूज करें चॉइसेस होती है ना तो आप न्यूट्रल नहीं रह सकते डिसीजन मेकिंग के अंदर हाँ आपने डिसीजन लिया आप कामयाब नाकाम भी हो सकते हैं लेकिन कामयाब भी हो सकते हैं लाइक बिल गेट्स ने लिया स्टीव जॉब्स ने लिया तो दे टुक वेरी बोल्ड डिसीजन कि जिसके ऊपर उन्होंने उन्हें तरक्की मिल गई लॉस भी हो सकता था सो इन ऑफिस वॉट हैपन्स इज दैट यू हैव विटनेस के हमारी मीटिंग्स जो है ना वो घंटों घंटों चलती रहती हैं और एंड ऑफ द डे सब लोग उठ के चले जाते हैं और कोई रिजल्ट नहीं मिलता फिर नेक्स्ट डे मीटिंग होती है नेक्स्ट डे ये बहुत ज़्यादा पैटर्न है कि पीपल आर नॉट एबल टू मेक अ डिसीजन डिस्पाइट हैविंग लॉन्ग डिस्कशन और जल्दी मीटिंग्स एंड अप करती हैं इन टू इन कन्फ्यूजन राधर दैन अ रेजोल्यूशन ऑफ एन इशू कन्फ्यूजन हो जाता है तो एडवर्ड डी बोनो एक बंदा है जो कि साइकोलॉजिस्ट डॉक्टर साइकोलॉजिस्ट है उसने एक बुक लिखी थी द सिक्स थिंकिंग हैट्स ठीक है अ लिटरल थिंकिंग स्ट्रैटी बाय एडवर्ड डी बोनो वो कहता है कि इंसान का जो माइंड होता है ना वो एक वक्त में एक चीज़ पे कंसंट्रेट कर सकता है तो ये मेटाफोरिकल है मतलब 
ہیڈس ہیں میٹافوریکل مطلب یہ امیجن کرنا ہے آپ نے کہ فار ایگزامپل میں اگر آپ سے کہتا ہوں کہ آپ نے وائٹ ہیڈ پہنا ہوا ہے ابھی ہم سب نے وائٹ ہیڈ پہنا ہے پہلی بات ہے ہم ایشو ڈیفائن کریں ایشو کیا ہے ہم یہ کلاس میں کریں گے بھی ایکسرسائز نیکسٹ کلاس میں ہم پہلے ایشو ڈیفائن کرتے ہیں اوکے از عمران خان گورنمنٹ گڈ اور بیڈ فار ایگزامپل ٹھیک ہے یہ اب ہمیں فیصلہ کرنا ہے کلاس میں کہ کیا ہے اور اینی ادر کوشچن تو ہم نے پہلی کرنی ہے وائٹ ہیڈ پہنی وائٹ ہیڈ کا مطلب کیا ہے With this thinking hat, you focus on the data available, look at the information you have and see what you can learn from it. Look at gaps in your... So, what do you do first? White hat means that you take all the information. That means, GDP has increased or not. And the perception indexes are... They do all the information about any issue. As much as possible. Do not think anything else. After that, I told you that you wear a red hat. Red hat ka matlab, wearing the red hat, you look at the problems using intuition, gut reactions and emotion. You yeah, basically see what are the problems in any issue that you are discussing. The government is bad, not going on, inflation is gut feeling is that it is wrong. Is that right? Negative. Negative. Black hat using thinking, look at all the bad points of the decision. You see the bad points of the decision. Is that right? Is that right? یہ جو ریڈ ہے اس میں آپ گٹ فیلنگ کو دیکھ رہے ہیں ریاکشنز کو لوگ کیا سمجھ رہے ہیں ضروری نہیں ہے کہ وہ ٹھیک ہوں غلط ہوں اچھا ریڈ ہیٹ کے وقت بلیک ہیٹ پہنا آپ نے پھر یلو پہنا تو یلو ہیٹ ہیلپس یو ٹو تھنک پوزیٹیولی صرف پوزیٹیو چیزیں گورنمنٹ کی دیکھتی ہیں اس نے یہ اچھا کیا یہ اچھا یہ کوئی نیگیٹیو تھاٹ اس کا کوئی بندہ کاغذ پہ نہیں لکھے گا گرین ہیٹ سٹینڈس فار کریٹیوٹی اب آپ نے بیٹھنا ہے کہ اچھا کیا کیا جا سکتا ہے کریٹیو تھنکنگ کیا ہونی چاہیے آپ کہتے ہیں نا یہ خراب ہے یہ صحیح ہے یہ ڈیفائن کر لیا آپ نے گٹ فیلنگ بھی ہو گئی اب آپ نے آپ کو میں کہتا ہوں کہ اچھا یار کیا نیا کیا جا سکتا ہے کیا چینج لائی جا سکتی ہے پریزیڈینشل فارم آف دا گورنمنٹ سم ادر فارم آف دا گورنمنٹ ایگزامپل دے رہا ہوں سو یو ہیو اے کریٹیوٹی ہیڈ اور بلو ہیڈ کس لیے دا بلو ہیڈ اسٹینڈس فار پروسیس کنٹرول یہ سارے جب ہیڈس آپ پہن رہے ہیں ایک ہیڈ دوسرا ہیڈ تیسرا ہیڈ یا آپ انٹرچینج بھی کر سکتے ہیں پہلے کون سا ہیڈ پہن لیا تو یہ بیسیکلی کنٹرول کر رہا ہے بلو ہیڈ کہ آپ کو کہ پروسیس آپ ٹھیک فالو کر رہے ہیں ہوتا یہ ہے کہ جب یہ آپ کسی بھی میٹنگز میں امپلیمنٹ کرتے ہیں اس اسٹریٹجی کو تو ڈسیزن جو ہوتا ہے آٹومیٹیکلی آپ کے سامنے آ جاتا ہے کہ کیا کرنا ہے سو یو ریچ اے ڈسیزن وائل گوئنگ تھرو دا پروسیس کہ اچھا یہ گورنمنٹ رہنی چاہیے یا نہیں رہنی چاہیے یو اینڈ اپ فائنڈنگ آؤٹ کہ کیا اس کا ڈسیزن ہوگا آٹومیٹیکلی ڈوئنگ دا ایکسرسائز سو ویل آئیڈینٹیفائی اے پرابلم ان نیکسٹ کلاس کوئی بھی آپ بھی سوچ کے لائیں اس کے بعد ہم لوگ اس کے پاس ہیڈس پہنیں گے فوکسنگ کے لیے کہ کس چیز پہ کریں پھر نیگیٹو کے اوپر کلا ہیڈ پازیٹو کا کریں گے پھر دیکھتے ہیں اس کا آؤٹ کم کیا ہوتا ہے اینڈ دس از اپلائڈ بائی مینی سی اوز ان دیر میٹنگس مینی آرگنائزیشنس فالو دس ٹول اس کو ٹول کہتے ہیں ٹو ریچ اینی ڈسیزن رادر دین اینڈنگ یور میٹنگس ان ٹو اے کنفیوژن یہاں تک سمجھ آ گئی اب ایڈورڈ ڈی بونو نے اس پہ لیکچر دیا ہوا اس کے دو پارٹس ہیں فرسٹ پارٹ بفور دا بریک اینڈ دین وی لسن ٹو دا سیکنڈ پارٹ لیکن آپ یہ غور سے سنیں بہت انٹرسٹنگ ہے اور بڑا افیکٹیو یہ مینز ہیں یہ کیا ہو گیا یہ اسٹوڈنٹس جو بات میں آئے ہیں ان کو بتا رہے تھے کہ ایک لائف ٹائم کے اندر ہمارے یہ سنگر ہیں یہ اسٹارٹیڈ ہز کیریئر ایز اے بس کنڈکٹر اور اس کے بعد فیم ظاہر اللہ کی طرف سے وائس کی تھی لیکن اصل اچیومنٹ اس بندے کی ہے کہ کنڈکٹر کے ذہن میں ایک سوچ تھی یہ واز ناٹ ایجوکیٹڈ ہی ایٹ اے تھنکنگ کہ میرے بچوں کو پڑھنا چاہیے ایجوکیٹ ہونا چاہیے تو اس نے بچوں کو پڑھایا اس کی بیٹی لا رہا ہے بتا کافی عرصے سے میں اس کو فالو کر رہا ہوں ڈفرینٹ ہالی ووڈ فلمس کے اندر اس نے ویڈیو اینیمیشنز اور اس پہ کام کر رہی ہے ٹھیک ہے اینڈ فائنلی ابھی ریسنٹ فلم آئی ہے اس کی اس میں وہ آسکر کے لیے نامینیٹ ہو گیا ہے فلم بھی نامینیٹ ہوئی ہے اور ایز اے ویژول آرٹسٹ بھی نامینیٹ ہوئی ہے یہ اس میں اس کا نام آیا ہے 
تو ہوپفلی شی ونس بٹ دیکھیں ایک انسان کی اس کو قسمت کہیں گے یا سوچ کہیں گے سوچ بھی ہے کہ انسان نے قسمت تو یہ تھی کہ وہ سنگر بن گیا سوچ یہ تھی کہ بچوں کو پڑھانا ایک ایسی انوائرمنٹ کریٹ کرنا تو اللہ تعالیٰ نے سکسیس دیکھیں اس طرح دیتا ہے کسی کو تسی بھی سوچو کچھ کرنا آستے تسی کچھ بھی لے لو اس کو بارڈ اوکے جی وی سٹارٹ وتھ دس تھرٹی منٹس اس کے بعد بریک اینڈ دین ادر تھرٹی منٹس Uh, talk on the six thinking hats which is a powerful tool a powerful method of improving thinking in the classroom and indeed elsewhere supposing I were to ask you what do you think is the most important invention that mankind has ever made well you might say of course the computer computer can enable us to do wonderful things and getting better all the time you might say a space rocket which can enable us to go to the moon and beyond to Mars. There's all sorts of things you might say. But supposing I were to suggest to you that the bicycle, the very simple, humble bicycle, is one of the most important inventions ever. Now, my reasoning is simple. That what the bicycle does, and this will more or less look like a bicycle, what the bicycle does, it allows a human being to use his or her muscle energy in a much more effective way. In other words, the bicycle doesn't use any other energy, as indeed a rocket does, or to some extent a computer does, although a small amount of electricity, but to use human energy in a much more effective way. Now, of course, if we imagine two people having a race, and they set off to run the race, and let's suppose this is a rather fat person for the moment, The thin person will obviously or likely go faster than the fat person. But now if we train the fat person to learn how to ride a bicycle, then once that person has learned, that person will go much further and much faster than the person without the bicycle. Of course, there is a learning period in which the person learning to ride the bicycle may not do as well as he or she would have done without the bicycle. But what the bicycle does is to allow us to use our human abilities much, much more effectively. Even if we look at a simple ladder, what does a ladder do? A ladder allows us to use our human muscular energy to climb to higher places in a way that is much easier than we would have to do without a ladder. So these are ways of improving the use of our existing abilities, energies, skills, and so on. I'm going to put down some figures. Now, what I want you to do is to add all those up as quickly as you can. Just add all those up as quickly as you can. Nothing magical about it, simple arithmetic. Add them up as quickly as you can. Well, that's not so easy. But let's suppose I put them one under the other. Now that becomes much easier to add them up. Now what have I done? I've simply changed the position. Just put things in such a way that it is easier to deal with them. Just as simple as that. But it makes a huge difference. How we put things make it, makes it much easier to deal with them. Let's look at another example. Suppose I ask you to add up the numbers going up from 1 to 10. All the way up to 10. Not too difficult and you'd reach the answer at 55. Supposing I said to you, let's make it a little bit more difficult, and I want you to add up all the numbers from 1 to 100. 
Well, it's easy, it's not complicated, you might make mistakes, it will take you a long time. But let's rearrange it. Let's rearrange it in a different way. And let's put our numbers going up. And this time, underneath, we will write the same numbers going backwards. And we're all the way backwards. Now we add them up, we add the top line to the bottom line, we'll always get 101. Because as we add one in the top line, we subtract one in the bottom line, the total stays the same. When we're finished, we'll have 100 times 101, twice as many as we need, and the answer is 5,050. Now, there we're rearranging things so we can do something rather more complex and do it more easily. Now that's what I'm going to be talking about really, about how we can rearrange things in our brain, in our mind, so that we can think more simply and more effectively. There's no magic about it. We're using the existing brain ability as such. Let's for a moment look at the relationship between intelligence and thinking. And perhaps the best way of describing that relationship is to look at the relationship between a motor car and the driver. The horsepower of a car, the engineering, the suspension, all that is the potential of the car. Just as intelligence is the potential of the brain, possibly determined by the speed of transmission along the neurons in the brain. But the way the car performs does not only depend on the horsepower. The way the car performs also depends on the skill of the driver. The skill of the driver. You may be able, may afford to buy a very powerful car, but you may be a bad driver. You may only be able to afford to buy a much more humble car, <clears throat> and yet you could be a very good driver. So one is a potential, one is the skill with which that potential is used. Intelligence is the potential of the mind. Thinking is the skill with which it is used. Now, I've taught thinking to classrooms ranging from one class made up entirely of Nobel Prize winners. And at first they said, how can anyone teach us thinking? We've won Nobel Prizes. But at the end of three days, they went away saying, yes, uh, these things work. So much so that three of them then wrote forwards to one of my books. So at one end of the spectrum, very intelligent, very gifted children, we need to teach thinking, otherwise we're wasting that superb intelligence. At the other end of the spectrum, with youngsters of perhaps lesser intelligence, we also need to teach thinking in order to make the best use of what is there, and of course, all in between. That is why in many countries now, the idea of teaching thinking as a skill is so established that by law, every child in school must do two hours a week on thinking skills. When you are making a decision, you have to think. And thinking is a skill. IQ is potential. So thinking is something which can be nurtured. A group is created to That is why, is the first thinking that we can change the system. Do so we're looking at thinking as a skill. You could also look at it as a form of software. If you buy a computer, you don't go home and say, I bought this wonderful computer and it's a Pentium 150 and it's got three gigabytes of storage and you say, well, I really don't care about the software. Clearly, no wonder, matter how wonderful the computer is, without software, you're not going to get anywhere. So what is the software that we use for the human brain. The most important computer of all, and indeed a vastly superior computer to any others, what is the software we use for that? And it's very limited and not really adequate for the functions that are necessary today. So we're looking at some sort of software for human thinking. Now, I'm going to describe a very, very simple form of software for thinking. It's widely used and it's very powerful, I'll just give you an example of just how widely used it is. Last June, I got two letters the same day. One letter was from the head of research of Siemens. Siemens is a big company in Germany. It's by far the biggest company in Europe. 
They employ 370,000 workers. Their annual turnover is $59,000 million. Big company. The head of research at Siemens wrote to me and he said, we were using your six hats at our last top research meeting and that was very successful. Same day, I get another letter from a young man called Simon Batchelor, who's in Cambodia, and he's there to help the Kaima villagers drill for water in their villages. And he could never get the villagers to be involved in their processes and the drill, they just weren't interested. And what he was looking for was some way of getting the villagers to be involved. He had his daughter with him, who was out of school, so he had one of my books called Teach Your Child How to Think. From that, he took the six hats, started teaching this to the Kaima villagers. Apparently, they, they became so enthusiastic, they said this is far more important than drilling for water, and the whole mission changed to teaching them thinking, teaching them the six thinking hats. Some days later, I was in Wellington, New Zealand, and the head of uh, Wellesley College, one of their leading schools, says we teach that routinely to our five-year-olds. So they were looking at this framework of thinking which I'm going to talk about, which really goes across from top executives in one of the world's largest companies to five rows via Kaima Villager. A very, very simple process. Now I want to emphasize that particularly because the process I'm going to talk about is very simple and very practical. That's a key point. Sometimes in education, people say if something is simple, it can't really be worthwhile, and people want things to be very complicated, and then they say they're very worthwhile, but unfortunately, we can't use them. So we're going to be looking at something very simple, very powerful, very effective. Now let's look for a moment at the whole business of teaching thinking. And I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but just in some detail. First, we might say there's osmosis. And we say if we have a very gifted teacher and a long exposure to youngsters, then some of the skills, the thinking habits of that very gifted teacher will transfer to the youngsters. And that is certainly true. It does happen. But it's not very practical because you need a long exposure and you also need a lot of very, very gifted children. So as a practical process, that really doesn't work. Then we might say, if we wait for children to make mistakes in thinking, and then we correct these mistakes, clearly children will make, or youngsters, students, pupils, will make thinking which has no mistakes, and therefore it's going to be very good thinking because it has no mistakes. Unfortunately, that's not true. Suppose you said we're going to teach people how to drive a car by making it so that they don't make any mistakes, well, the simplest thing to do is to leave the car in the garage and you won't make any mistakes, but you won't get anywhere either. In other words, just avoiding mistakes is totally insufficient. We need the generative, productive aspects of thinking. Just avoiding mistakes is not enough. Then we might say we're going to have discussions and we're going to have children discussing some subject and as they discuss it, we're going to encourage them to use better thinking, and we're going to hope they're going to abstract these thinking points and then perhaps use them elsewhere. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen well either, because if your attention is on the subject of the discussion, it's very difficult to pay attention to the abstracted points. So the process which I prefer is the tools process. Tools process means we create some tools some frameworks which we then practice on different situations that embeds skill in the tool and then you take the tool and you apply it elsewhere. In other words, the skill is portable. You can take it and apply it anywhere. And that's what we're going to be looking at. One particular tool, one particular frame. Now it's true that some people say quite rightly they say whatever we're teaching, whatever subject we're teaching, we're teaching it in a thinking manner, and surely if we teach subjects well, then thinking is going to improve. Youngsters, students are thinking all the time, and if you're thinking all the time, surely your thinking will improve. Not necessarily so. 
Imagine that you are a typist and at the age of 15, you start typing with two fingers. And suppose you become a journalist and for the rest of your life, you're typing hundreds, maybe thousands of words every day. At the age of 60, you will still be typing with two fingers. You might now be a very good two finger typist. Similarly, the fact that you are thinking does not make you better at thinking. It only makes you better at that particular type of thinking you're doing. So if you're a bad thinker and you practice a lot, a lot, a lot, you will become an excellent bad thinker. You won't suddenly change to becoming a good thinker. Now, if that youngster at the age of 15 had taken a five-week course in touch typing, then for the rest of that youngster's career, that youngster would have been a touch typist. So we need to teach thinking explicitly, directly, the notion that it'll just rub off because thinking is being used in other subject areas is not sufficient. We can do things very directly. Now the particular frame that I'm going to talk about in a little while is very powerful. For instance, IBM used it at one of their top laboratories. They found it reduced meeting times to one quarter of what they had been before. Indeed, a friend of mine was involved in jury service, two parallel cases. The first case, the jury deliberated for four hours to reach a conclusion. Second case, using the six hats framework, within 15 minutes, they had a solution. Much, much quicker. There was a simple little exercise I did on some senior public servants, and these were mostly university graduates, and I asked them to think about a subject, and then crossed over the subject, and asked them to use the hats on it, and they had a 493% change in their thinking. There was almost a five-fold increase in thinking productivity using the very simple frame that I'm going to talk about now. What do we mean by frame? Well, imagine we send an explorer off to an island, and this explorer comes back, and we say, what did you see? The explorer says, well, there was this volcano in the corner for smoking, and there was this funny bird which didn't fly. And you say, well, that's fine, but what else did you notice? What else did you see? And the explorer said, well, that's all that caught my attention. So you send the explorer back, and this time you say, very simply, I want you to look north, take your notebook, see what you see. I want you to look east, take your notebook, and south, and west, and so on. When you come back, you'll have a much fuller scan of that island. Now, what is north, south, east, and west? They are just frameworks for directing attention. So the framework I'm... We're going to be looking at now is one which allows us to direct attention, allows us to do one thing at a time. And that is very, very important. One thing at a time. Often when we're thinking, the main problem is confusion. We're trying to do everything at the same moment. So two things happen. One is we are confused. The second thing is unless we have frames to direct attention, we only see a very small part of what there is to see. So we're going to be looking at six hats, which is a way of directing attention, a way of doing one thing at a time. Now we need to go back to what our traditional thinking is. Where did our traditional habits of thinking come from? And we go back to the fall of Rome in AD 400. After the fall of Rome in Europe, there were the Dark Ages. Dark Ages, because we don't know much about them, because the great learning, reading, writing, scholarship of the Greek Roman period disappeared. Then came the Renaissance. Renaissance was the rediscovery of classic Greek Roman thinking. This was like a, f a breath of fresh air, allowed humankind to use logic and reason to work things out, gave humankind a more central position in the universe. So this wonderful new thinking was eagerly adopted by, by a civilization, both by the church and the non-church, became the dominant software of Western thinking and has remained so to this day. 
But what was this wonderful thinking? We need to go back in history again to 400 to 300 BC and the Gang of Three. First of the Gang of Three was Socrates. Socrates was mainly concerned in showing why things were wrong. Socrates was very interested in dialectic or argument. In 80% of the discussions in which, in which Socrates was involved, there was no constructive outcome. And when his listeners said, you say everything is wrong, so what is right? Socrates would say, not my business. My business is to say what's wrong. Now, for his purposes, this was absolutely correct. Socrates was trying to find out how people used words like love, justice, courage, and so on. So just as if you were discovering the rules of grammar, if you say, well, that's a bad use, and that's a bad use, and that's a bad use, in the end, you are indeed left with the correct, the right uses. So for his purposes, that was fine. But the emphasis was very much on saying, if we can show what is wrong, we will be left with what is right. Then there was Plato. Plato was very influenced by Pythagoras, who had shown mathematical truths. You may remember. Pythagoras theorem in a right angle triangle A squared equals B squared plus C squared. Plato is very interested in the truth. What is the underlying truth? Then we had Aristotle. Among other things, Aristotle believed that men had more teeth in their mouth than did women. And although he was married twice, he never asked either of his wives to open their mouth to count their teeth. He didn't need to because he knew. With horses, the stallion has more teeth than the man, so he established as a general principle that the male of the species has more teeth than the female, therefore he had more teeth than his wives, and that was easier than counting, they probably had bad breath anyway. Now, so what Aristotle did, he said, from the past, let us create boxes, categories, definitions, then we come across something, we analyze it down so we can recognize it, then we judge, does it fit in this box or does it not fit in this box? Something could not both fit and not fit, and it couldn't be anywhere else. Those are Aristotle's two principles. From that arose our method of thinking, which is very largely concerned with argument. In argument, A has a point of view, B has a point of view, they argue, B seeks to prove A wrong, A seeks to prove B wrong, occasionally you get a synthesis of both. Now that system is fine, it's a very useful system, very useful for discovering the truth. But it was never, never designed to be constructive. It is a system which is very lacking in constructive energy, very lacking in creative energy, very lacking in design energy, because it was never intended for those purposes. It was intended to discover what is. What is the truth? Now, in a stable world, that's fine. In a stable world, the boxes from the past are every bit as useful in the future, but not so in a changing world. In a changing world, the boxes may not apply. In a changing world, we need design. How we put things together. It's the difference between what is, existing knowledge, existing routines, and what can be creativity, construction, design. All our emphasis has been on that, not enough on what can be. So we need to develop, we need to invent a constructive idiom of thinking, which is not normally part of the Western tradition of thinking, which has a very good idiom for discovering the truth called argument, not one for designing something better. 
So that is where we come to parallel thinking. Parallel thinking, instead of A arguing with B, A and B are thinking together, in parallel, in the same direction, cooperatively. Now, of course, we... We need to vary the direction. And for that, we invent a very simple framework, which is the six hats. Six hats means that as someone sits thinking, there are imaginary metaphorical hats which you put on or take off. You wear one hat at a time. Now, what are these hats? Well, we start with the first hat. The first hat is a, the white hat. You can think of white as paper, printout, computer printout. White hat is what information is available what information is needed, what information is missing, and very important, how are we going to get the information we need. White Hat is a direct focus on information. When the White Hat is in use, everyone in that group wears the White Hat, everyone is focusing on information. If the information does not agree, even if it's contradictory, you put it down in parallel. You accept both versions. Later, when you come to design the outcome, you need to decide between them, then you decide between them, or design something which satisfies both. So that's the white hat. Direct, exclusive focus on information. Then we move to the next hat. The next hat is the red hat. You can think of red as far and warm, the red hat is feelings. Feelings, intuition, and emotions. Normally, in uh, thinking, you're not supposed to allow your emotions to come in. Of course, they come in anyway. You just disguise them as logic. What the red hat does, it allows you to signal that this is your feeling. You're not pretending it's anything else. Now, intuition can be based on a lot of experience in the field, which comes together to give you a gut feeling. That is very useful. Does not mean it's always right. It's not always right. When they told Einstein about Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, Einstein says, my intuition says that's wrong. God doesn't play dice. Nature doesn't work that way. Turned out the great Einstein's intuition was wrong. Heisenberg was right. But the red hat allows you to put forward intuition, feelings, emotions, without any need to explain or justify them. Then we come to the next hat. The next hat is the black hat. You can think of black as the judge's robes. The black hat is caution. Caution. Caution, risk assessment, and critical. Why something doesn't fit our ethics, our value, our budget, our policy, whatever it is. Black hat is an extremely useful hat. Possibly the most useful hat because it stops us doing things which are dangerous, damaging, polluting, and so on, illegal, and so on. Very, very useful hat. But it is very easy to overuse. Now, that's why I like wine. Wine is excellent, tastes nice and reduces the incidence of heart attack, at least it does if you're a Frenchman, but too much wine can give you cirrhosis of the liver and make you an alcoholic. That is not the fault of the wine, that is the fault of overuse. Food is necessary, too much food can make you overweight with possible health problems, not the fault of the food, the fault of overuse. Now the, emphasis, the reason I emphasize this is far too many people believe that somehow the black hat is a bad hat. It is not. It is an excellent hat, possibly the most useful. But with it, we look at the caution areas, the difficulties, the dangers. That does not make it a bad hat. 
A judge who's sitting in court deals with criminals most of the time, does not make the judge a criminal. Keep that very clearly in mind. Black hat is evaluation, caution, very, very important hat. Then we come to the next hat. The next hat is the yellow hat. I draw brown because yellow doesn't show too well with my pens. That's the yellow hat. The yellow hat is the logical positive. In a sense, the black hat is the logical negative, but on the whole, I don't like calling the black hat negative because people get the wrong idea that somehow it's a bad hat. The yellow hat, logical positive, we make a strong effort to look for benefits. Benefits, values, and how we can make something work. But we must show the support for it, the logical reasons for it. The yellow hat, logical reasons. Yellow hat is much, much more difficult than the black hat. Black hat is very natural. The brain has a very natural mechanism for saying that is not what I'm used to, that is not what it's supposed to be. That is very natural. The brain does not have an equivalent mechanism for saying that has benefits, that has value. Therefore, we need really to develop that yellow hat attitude. Looking for benefits, looking for value, it does not come as naturally as the black hat. So very key hat. We need to develop a skill in doing it. We need to develop what I call value sensitivity. Value sensitivity, the word sensitivity is the same as sensitive photographic film. Value sensitivity means that we develop a high sensitivity to value. If we look at that with a golfing analogy, imagine you're playing golf and you get the ball on the green and then you try very hard to get it in the hole. And some people think that's important. Now, just imagine how much easier golf would be if the green was shaped like that. So when you got the ball here, it rolled down by itself and got in the hole. That's the same with value sensitivity. If you don't develop value, develop value sensitivity, then you've got to see the value directly staring you in the face. But if you develop value sensitivity, then from a distance, you can sense the value and come towards it. So yellow hat, value sensitivity, very important part of thinking.
ओके जी लाइट्स ऑफ कर रहे हैं You can think of green as vegetation, growth, energy, branches, sprouts. The green hat is the creative hat. When the green hat is in use, everyone is making an effort to be creative. It is not just a matter of one person in the meeting having ideas and everyone being ready to jump on that person and attack those ideas. Everyone is expected to be creative. Be creative or keep quiet. Creative, we're looking for new ideas. We're looking for alternatives. We're looking for possibilities and provocation and lateral thinking also come under the green hat. Now, a very, very important word on that list is possibilities. Possibilities is the most important word behind Western progress in science and technology. Many people say our progress is due to information and logical deduction. That is total nonsense, total nonsense. Without possibilities, we would have got nowhere. Why is it so important? Because in science, you have evidence. Then someone comes along with a creative possibility, which we call a hypothesis. That allows us to focus attention collect more information, design experiments, gives us something to work towards. Now it's true that knowing that our hypothesis is going to be criticized, going to be attacked, we try harder to build up supporting evidence. But the critical destruction of a hypothesis has never produced a better one. A better one is produced by someone coming along with a new possibility and a new possibility. That is the basis of progress in science. In technology... The possibility Harder to build up supporting evidence. But the critical destruction of a hypothesis has never produced a better one. A better one is produced by someone coming along with a new possibility and a new possibility. New possibility. That is the basis of progress in science. science in technology. The possibility is the vision. vision. We have this vision, we can imagine something, and then we try and work towards it. So important is a possibility system that we can see what happens to a major culture which never developed the possibility system. China. 2,000 years ago, China was way ahead of the Western technology. They had gunpowder, rockets, bronze, paper, and so on. 
Had they continued at the same rate, today China would be far ahead of the West. Highly intelligent people, very, very intelligent people who work and study very hard. Didn't happen. Why? Because at this stage, the technicians were trying things out. Let's try this, let's try that, making progress. Then it got into the hands of the scholars. Now, the scholars were very keen to describe everything. Everything was tied up in description packages. The Chinese never developed the concept of the hypothesis. So their progress came to a dead end. Where did the hypothesis came, come from? Also came from Greek thinking, but the Greek thinking before the Gang of Three, the pre-Socratic thinkers who were much better thinkers. So the possibility system, very, very important part of the green hat system. Creativity, possibility, very important. Then we come to the last of the hats. The last of the hats is the blue hat. You can think of blue as sky and overview. The other hats are looking at the subject, looking at the content of the thinking. The blue hat is looking at the process itself. The blue hat is standing back, looking at the thinking. Just as the conductor of an orchestra is getting the best out of the orchestra by having the instruments play as they're supposed to play, just as the ringmaster of a circus is organizing which events happen. So the blue hat is looking at the thinking itself, the processes of thinking. The blue hat will say, how do we define the situation? With what do we want to end up? The blue hat is concerned with decisions, summaries, outcomes, next step. Very, very key. So what we have there is these six hats. Six hats allow us to think in parallel. So at one moment, instead of traditional argument, sorry, instead of traditional argument, A and B may both be wearing the white hat. What information do we have here? Then A and B together might be wearing the green hat. What are the alternatives? What are the ideas? What are the possibilities? Then they might be wearing the black hat, the caution. What might go wrong? What do we need to think about? Then the yellow hat, and so on and so on. So although we're thinking cooperatively, you're still going all around the subject to get a full view of that subject. Now the advantage of the method is that you're using all the intelligence, all the information, all the experience of everyone at any moment. It is not a matter of people dividing into for and against and so on. Now, of course, people always say, yes, well, I'm thinking of anything. I always look at the pros and cons, a balanced view. When you do experiments and you get people to use the hat explicitly, you get huge changes, huge changes. Three, four hundred, even five hundred percent changes, big changes, just by asking people explicitly to do what they claim to be doing. Now, the reasons you get these changes is one of the main things is what I call separation. When we're normally thinking, we're trying to do everything at the same moment. For example, we might be being cautious, intuitive, creative, all at the same moment. Here we say, no, let's do one thing at a time. Let's have our mind being creative at one moment, intuitive, cautious, all at different times, not all at the same moment. Now there is some evidence that the way the brain works, the balance of neurotransmitters in the brain is different when we're thinking creatively from when we're thinking positively from when we're thinking cautiously. If this is so, then there's an absolute need to separate out the modes of thinking because you cannot do all the modes of thinking optimally at any one point. It's rather like if you're playing golf and you have your driver, which is good for long shots, 
and you have your putter, which is good for putting, you can't say to yourself, well, I don't need all those different clubs. I'm going to have this super club, which is just as good for driving as it is for putting. The answer is you won't get one. It will always be suboptimal on anything. Similarly, when you believe that you're thinking optimally, you never are. You're thinking suboptimally in every different mode. And that is one of the reasons we need to separate out the modes of thinking. And that reason is physiological, the balance of neurotransmitters. So that is one of the uh, values, one of the reasons why we need to use something like... So, what do you think? Brain is a function of our character. It is function that we can process one thing that one thing is better than one thing that we can focus on. Bas. We can separate them. Rather than just thinking and thinking, positive thinking and positive thinking, negative thinking, the six hats process. Another of the values is to do with ego. But one of the biggest problems in thinking is people's ego. That if you don't like an idea, you're not going to try and find anything in its favor. On the other hand, if you are enthusiastic about an idea, you may not be sufficiently cautious. Now, what happens with a hat system is that if you don't like an idea, when the black hat is in use, you are invited to be as critical as you possibly can. But when the yellow hat is now in use, you are being asked to find the benefits and values in that idea. And if you sit there and say, I cannot see any values, but if people around you are finding values, you are now seen to be deficient, defective, inadequate as a thinker. So you shift from being the macho defender of an idea to being seen as a poor thinker. In other words, we shift attention, we shift the balance from ego behavior to your performance as a thinker. And that's very key. And once people start using the system, the framework, their thinking changes, becomes much more constructive, much more positive. We no longer have the argument mode, which really is a sort of a transfer of a, a fight or a battle into another mode. We have cooperative, constructive thinking. Now, the framework is very, very simple. I mentioned earlier that it's used from top corporations their senior executive worldwide, IBM, Prudential, Nabisco, for Texas Instruments, Federal Express, NASA, the Space Agency use it, and so on and so on. Right down to five girls in school. So it's something which is very simple to teach and very simple to use. There's nothing complex about it. But there are one or two points which I need to emphasize. One point which is very important is the six hats are not repeat not, repeat not, repeat not, not categories of people. A lot of psychology is obsessed with categories. He's this, she's that, he's this, she's that. Once you put people in boxes, they sink ever deeper, never get out. The six hats are absolutely not categories of people. When the hats are on use, everyone at that moment is wearing the same hat. So if the green hat is in use, everyone is metaphorically wearing the green hat. It's not a matter of someone sitting there saying, I am the resident black hat thinker, that's all I'm going to do. Everyone is wearing the same hat. Then the hat will change, everyone changes. Sometimes I've got, come across people who've been inadequately trained, got the wrong idea, and they say, we've got a meeting, and should we have one permission? Here, everyone is looking in the same direction, and everyone should be able to use all hats, just as when you're driving a car, you should be able to use all the gears. You don't say, well, I'm just a first gear driver, or I only know how to drive in the fourth gear. Use all the gears. Indeed, we often find that people who hitherto have considered themselves black hat critical users, given the hat system, they say, fine, I can do that, but I can also do the creative side. And indeed, they enjoy that possibility, they enjoy that holiday from their normal thinking, the ability to think 
differently. Now, the second point, which is important, is that if we want to change people's behavior, we usually try and change the person. Religion may say, let's make you a better person, then you'll treat other people better. Then along came Freud and says, if we understand your motives, your behavior, your background, your upbringing, we understand why you do things, that understanding may make you behave better. And then you have various forms of training, sensitivity training, make you a better person, you behave better. Now, all those systems are slow and not very effective in changing behavior. So now we might go back for a moment to Confucius from China. Confucius said, what I'm really interested in is how you behave to others. Not so much what your psyche is, how you behave. How you behave to your family, to your subordinates, to your superiors, to your colleagues, and so on. Get your behavior right, and the rest will follow. Now, the six hats mode is in that direction. If you are an aggressive person, the six hats is not going to say to you, don't be aggressive. But if the yellow hat is in use, then be aggress aggressive, but you have to use your aggression in a positive, constructive fashion. So by going straight to behavior, you can get big, big changes. You're not trying to change people first in order to get different behavior. You're going straight to behavior. Now, there are two broad ways of using the hats. The first way is what I call occasional. Occasional, as it implies, is the use of a single hat, one at a time. You might be having a discussion, an argument, or something of the sort, and at a certain point you feel you need new ideas, you need fresh alternatives. So you say, right now, for three minutes, let's have some green hat thinking. That indicates two things. Let's have some deliberate creative thinking, and let's all think in parallel for that time. At the end of that time, you can get back to your conversation, discussion, argument, whatever it was. Later on, you might get to a point where you have a suggestion and you need to assess the risks. So you say, let's have some black hat thinking for a limited period of time. So occasional means the use of a single hat in order to ask for a mode of thinking. This can become part of the language of a school, of a family, of an organization. So at any moment, whether it's a family argument or a discussion or in school and you're treating a subject, you can say, right now, let's have some green hat thinking on this. Now, because the colors of the hats are artificial, it allows you to ask for a big change in thinking very sharply. If you just said to yourself, if you just said to yourself, or to others, don't be so negative, or let's be more creative or something, that is very weak. Because people take it a, a, a personally, if you say don't be negative, but with the hats it's abstract, it's impersonal, it's remote. You can say it's very good black hat thinking, now let's have some yellow hat thinking. So what you do with the hats, it gives you a language, a symbology for switching thinking as often as you like and as sharply as you like. And that's one of its great advantages. It gives you a way of handling thinking, putting strategy into thinking. Then the second way we can use the hats is the systematic way. Systematic means we put together an agenda, a program of hats, and use them one after the other, going through them sequentially. Now, how much time do we spend under each hat? That will depend on how many people are on the group, but it's much, much better to set a short time, maybe as short as three minutes. But if at the end of three minutes, you're still getting caution ideas, you extend the time as necessary. Much better to set a short time and extend it than to set a long time and sit, sit around wondering what to think next. Now what we find is that with the hats, because the method is so fast, you can say a great deal in a very short time. Because in normal thinking, 
when someone says something, you are obliged to respond to what has been said, even if only out of politeness. With the six hat system, everyone at every moment is thinking about the subject. The ideas are put down in parallel. You do not agree or disagree, you put it down in parallel. So much, much faster. Now, in terms of the systematic use, there are two broad approaches to setting up the sequence. The first approach is what we might call preset. Preset means you put the sequence of hats together before you start, and then you go through that sequence one after the other. Preset. Second type is evolving. Evolving means you choose the first hat, and when you finish with that, you choose the second, and when you finish with that, you choose the third. Now, I would advise you against evolving until you are very familiar with the framework. The reason is that you will spend so much time arguing about which hat to use next, you won't have much time to think about the subject. So, now there's no one right sequence. You can use that each hat as often as you like, or not at all. There's no one right sequence. The sequence will vary a lot depending on the subject that is being considered. Generally speaking, you would always start with a blue hat. The blue hat at the beginning is to say, what are we thinking about? If it's a problem, what are alternative definitions of the problem? The blue hat is there to say, with what do we want to end up? The blue hat is there to set the agenda of hats as you go through. So the blue hat is setting up the situation. What are we here for? What are we doing? What type of thinking is it? Is it problem solving? Is it exploration? Is it design? Similarly, at the end, we have another blue hat, which is like the other bookend. And this blue hat says, what have we achieved? Under this blue hat, we make decisions, outcomes, we design the next steps, and so on. Now, very often people say to me, all this is exploration. How do we make the final decision? What in practice very often happens is by the time you've got to the end, the decision has made itself. Because if we look at it, what is decision making? Decision making means directing our attention to the consequences of a choice, to our feelings, to our values, and making a decision. But if all these have been laid out under the hats, the decision has actually designed itself. So when you come to the end, the decision is very often self-evident. Because if we look at it, what is decision making? Decision making means directing our attention to the consequences of a choice, to our feelings, to our values, and making a decision. But if all these have been laid out under the hats, the decision has actually designed itself. So when you come to the end, the decision is very often self-evident. Last year in England, there was a write-up on the six hats in the Financial Times, and the following week I had a letter from a fellow who said he was in the country with his wife and they couldn't decide whether to buy this particular house or not. And they'd been arguing about it for two or three hours. He then said to his wife, let's try that six hats things I read about, six hats thing I read about in the paper last week. And they tried it, he said, within three minutes they had a decision. In other words, laying things out clearly, rather like laying out a road map, a road map the decision is often self-evident. So blue hat at the beginning, blue hat at the end. In between, it will vary with what is being done. For example, if you are assessing something, then you would start with a yellow hat, because if under the yellow hat, when you're making your strongest effort to find benefits and values, if you cannot find many benefits and values, that is the end of it. There is no merit in that idea. You don't even need to use the black hat. But if under the yellow hat you find lots of benefits and values, and then you come to the black hat, and now you find lots of problems and difficulties and so on, at least now you're motivated to, come to overcome those problems because you have seen the benefits. 
But if you start off with a black hat, before you've seen any benefits, and you find a lot of problems and difficulties, you're going to dismiss that idea without ever having explored the benefits. So in general, in assessment, it makes sense to start with the yellow hat. After the black hat, you may then use the green hat, even if you're using it elsewhere, to see how you can overcome some of those difficulties. Some of them you can immediately say, we can overcome so-and-so. Some of them you can't. You have to note the ones you can't, come back to it later, think about that particular point. If it's a neutral situation, after the first blue hat, you may want to use the white hat. Let's lay out the information. Then you may want to use the green hat. Let's think of alternative possibilities. Then you may explore those alternatives and possibilities with the black hat and with the yellow hat on each of them. If it's a situation where you believe that there are strong feelings, strong emotions, after the first blue hat, you may want to use the red hat. For example, before the elections in South Africa, they asked me to teach the six hat system, the framework, to the heads of all the peace accord committees in the different uh, townships in South Africa, and they had to solve all the local problems, and they always would start with the red hat. Let people sound off, let them express their feelings, let them express their emotions, and then there was no need to try and feed these into everything for the rest of the meeting. So in that case, you start with the red hat. Get your feelings out on the table. You can use the red hat later. Later, you can feed in the red hat to see if the feelings have changed or if they are still the same. So red hat. There wouldn't be any point in starting with the red hat if there were not existing feelings, because you wouldn't ask people to adopt feelings if they were not already there. Also, in a few cultures, there's a danger that if you start with the red hat and the senior person, teacher, or boss expresses his or her feelings. Okay. So you can complete the uh, rest of it yourself. So, aap mein se light on karein. So, ab aapko samajh Ab humne karna kisi wakat ye kaam practically karwana hai. Kaun? वॉल्टियर करता है ये करवाने के लिए किसी भी प्रॉब्लम के ऊपर सिक्स थिंकिंग हैड्स को अप्लाई करें फरा आप हाँ जी 